The Seal Book. Once again, the keeper of the book has opened the ponderous door to the secret vault, wherein is kept the great sealed book, in which is recorded all the secrets and mysteries of mankind through the ages. Here are tales of every kind, tales of murder, of madness, of dark deeds strange and terrible beyond all belief. Keeper of the book, I wouldn't know what tale we tell this time. Open the great book and let us read. Slowly, the great book opens. One by one, the keeper of the book turns the pages and stops. Ah, the strange story of a beautiful woman whose jealousy was so great that even the grave could not give her peace. A tale called Death at Stormhouse. Here is a tale, Death at Stormhouse, as it is written in the pages of the sealed book. It takes place in the old New England mansion known as Storm House, perched high on the cliffs above the crashing waves of the Atlantic Ocean. In her bedroom, Lizette Lester, young and beautiful mistress of Storm House, lies desperately ill, listening to the storm that is raging outside as her husband and Dr. Warren, their lifelong friend, hover over her. John. John. Yes, Lizette. John, open the window. I want to hear the storm. I want to hear the thunder crash and the wind scream. I'll open it, John. You stay with Lizette. Thank you, Howard. Oh, it's a wonderful storm. I've known it was coming for three days. I've always known when a storm was coming, haven't I, John? Yes. Yes, Lizette. You've always known. And I've been waiting for this one. I've been waiting for it so I could die as I was born. On a night when there's a storm filling the sky and death riding the wind to take me as it took my mother that night. Lizette, don't say that. You mustn't excite yourself, Lizette. It weakens you. I'm dying, Doctor. You know it as well as I do. It's only the storm that's keeping me alive now. Oh, Lizette. Lizette. John, darling. Yes, Lizette. In my will, there's a bequest to old Andrew for his faithful service. Everything else is left to you, including the house. On condition that you live here at least six months out of every year for the rest of your life. Lizette, I can't bear to talk about it. We must, darling. You don't mind the condition that you live here half of every year, do you? Of course not, my dearest. I couldn't bear to think of you as ever very far from me, in life or in death. I'll always be with you, my darling. And you won't marry again, will you, John? Never, Lizette. I swear it. You've sworn it, John. You mustn't break your vow. If you do, I'll be angry. Very angry. And when I'm angry, I do terrible things. You know that. I know, darling. You have my promise. I'll never break it. Oh, it's such a beautiful night. All my life, I've never been able to sleep on a night like this. I wonder if now, now when the storm sweeps in from the sea, I'll know it and wake up. Lizette. Lizette. John. She's gone. (laughs) 
Uh, there, it's done, Mr. John. I couldn't want better if it was myself buried down there in the ground. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, I'll put the tools away now. Call me if you want me. I can't believe it's Lizette we've buried here, Howard. Somehow she seems still alive. She loved living so. It's a beautiful spot here on the edge of the cliff. She made me promise she should be buried here. Where she could watch the storms come in from the sea. Hear the waves beating on the rocks below. John, do you mind if I speak personally to you? But why should I? You're my best friend. My only one, in fact. That's one of the things I wanted to talk about. In the three years since you married, you haven't painted a single picture. No. No, I haven't. I've started some, but... There was always something Lizette wanted to do. For three years you've been cooped up here, seeing no one. You might as well have been in prison. You should get away for a while now. Why don't you spend the winter in New York? Renew old friendship. Catch up on what's happening in painting. Yes. I'd like that. And there's another thing. Yes, Howard? The promise you made to Lizette. Promise? Oh, you mean not to marry again? Yes. You mustn't take it too seriously. You're too young to spend your life alone, grieving. Lizette wouldn't have made you promise if she had thought... I... I don't know. It seemed to mean so much to her. Well, when Lizette was alive, it seemed quite impossible to me I should ever love another woman. But you will... And I'm sure Lizette would understand. I... I'll think about it, Howard. The truth is, just now I feel a little confused. Well, let time take care of the matter. But you will close up Storm House and try a few months in the city? Yes, I will. I'll come back in the spring. After all, I'm obligated to live here half the year. But I'll leave old Andrew in charge and spend the winter in New York. And now to continue the story, as it is written in the sealed book. Once away from the somber atmosphere of Stormhouse, John Lester seemed to waken as if from a dream. He began to paint again, to live as he had before his marriage to Lisette. Then at a party he met Nora Maynard, young, gay, lovely. And one day in the spring he brought her back to Stormhouse as his bride. He introduced her to old Andrew, the caretaker, showed her through the house, then took her out to see the magnificent view from the top of the cliffs. Oh, John, it's a wonderful old place. The house, the cliffs, the sea. I'm going to love every minute here. I was afraid it might seem rather wild and gloomy to you, Nora. Oh, no. Look, the clouds, the waves tossing as far as you can see, the ocean way down below us. It's magnificent. Yeah, it can be frightening, too, when a real storm comes sweeping in from the sea. John, what's that? Over there on that little point? It's Stormhouse's private burying ground. That grave you see is Lizette's. Lizette? Will you tell me more about her sometime, John? Yes, of course. Well, now we'd better go in. It's almost dark. All of a sudden, the wind seems to be rising. Oh, just one minute more. I want to tell Andrew to phone the village for groceries before the stores close. Well, you run in and tell him. I'll come in right away. Well, then don't be long. The wind's getting cold. Poor Lizette. I wonder what she was like. I wonder if she used to stand here and watch the darkness sweep over the sea and... <gasps> John? Is that you? John, it's so dark I can't see you. John, don't I... I'll fall Nora! Nora, what is it? Oh. Did you call me, Nora? Oh, John, you... You frightened me. I thought you really were trying to push me over. Push you over? I know you were just joking, but I almost lost my balance. I almost went over the cliff. Nora, I didn't push you. I was halfway up the path when you called. You were... halfway up the path? I wouldn't play a joke like that. You must have become dizzy. I... I suppose so. But I was sure I felt your hand push me. And the wind seemed to force me toward the edge. It must have been the height. Made you lose your balance. Yes, of course. That was it. Darling, come inside now. You promise me you won't ever go close to the edge of the cliff again. Yes, let's go inside. And I promise, John, the cliff 
frightens me now. During those first weeks after John Lester returned to Storm House with his new bride, the wind never ceased to howl about the great old house. Several times when Nora was walking near the cliffs, strong gusts sprang up that would have pushed her over to her death if she had been walking closer to the edge. Then one afternoon, Nora discovered old Andrew piling flat, large rocks on top of Lizette's grave. Andrew, why, what in the world are you doing? What are those rocks on Lizette's grave for? It's the wind, Miss Nora. Blowing night and day like it has, it's been blowing the dirt right from off Miss Lizette's grave. How strange. Yes, sir. Give it a couple more weeks and it uh, scooped up all the earth and had the coffin clear uncovered. But the rocks will stop that. Uh, yeah, I guess that's enough. Andrew. Yes, ma'am. Did Lizette love John so very much? Uh, love Mr. Lester? Why, yes, I expect she did, ma'am, in her way. In her way? Uh, excuse me, Miss Nora, I got to drive to town now for a package for Mr. Lester. Oh, his new paints from New York. He's been so impatient for them. Oh, uh, Andrew. Uh, yes, ma'am? That big stone vase on the upper terrace, right beside the steps. It's uh, loose on its base. I saw it swaying yesterday as if it were going to fall over into the garden. Please fix it, will you? Yeah, as soon as I get back from town, ma'am. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, you know that Dr. Warren's staying for dinner. Uh, yes, Mr. Lester told me. Oh, well, I promised to meet him in the garden at four. Be sure to fix the vase, Andrew. Dr. Warren, if I kept you waiting long? Well, there you are, Nora. I was just beginning to be afraid you'd gone too close to the cliff and become dizzy again. Oh, no. After almost falling over twice, I don't take any chances That's now. That's the spirit. Where's John? Painting on the upper terrace. There he is now. Oh. John! Oh, hello, you two. What are you plotting down there? A tour of the caves down by the beach. Knock off for the day and come along. Please do, John. Well, maybe I will. Light's fading. John, don't lean on the stone vase. It's loose and... Oh! Nora, look out! <gasps> Nora! Nora, are you hurt? I'm coming down. <sighs> Good grief, that was close. Fell right where you were standing. <sighs> you... You pulled me back. Just in time. Nora, are you all right? Yes. Yes... Thanks to Dr. Warren, he, he saved me. I couldn't move. I can't understand it. I'd hardly touched it when I went over. You must have leaned against it harder than you realized. No, I didn't. I just touched it. It gave way all of a sudden. Oh, thank heaven you were here, Howard. It, it must have been the wind. And the vase was loose. I was just telling Andrew to fix it. Oh, if you'd been hurt, Nora. Oh, oh, a miss is as good as a mile, darling. Come on, let's forget the caves and go in and have tea instead. The wind has turned awfully cold all of a sudden. Listen to that confounded wind. I can't even read anymore. It makes such a racket. Would you like me to read to you, darling? No, no. I'm just jumpy, I guess. It, it isn't something special, is it? You're not regretting that you married me. Oh, don't be silly, Nora. It's just the wind. For the last two months, it hasn't let up night or day. Listen to it now. Oh, it is upsetting, darling. Sometimes it sounds just like a voice saying something you can almost make out, but not quite. I haven't painted a stroke in two months. Every day I get my canvas and my paints ready, and then the wind rises and distracts me. You're not sleeping well, are you, John? No, I haven't slept for weeks. Nor I can't stand it any longer. I can't stand it. That wind doesn't stop blowing. I think I'll go mad. Oh, my darling, my darling. John, listen to me. Listen to me, dear. We must go away from Stormhouse, away from the wind. We must, John. I... I... But the will... The will doesn't matter. Oh, John, please say yes. We can't ever be happy here. There's... There's something about the place that will forever prevent us. Leave Stormhouse... Never come back. And never come back. Yes. Yes, Nora, you're right. We'll do it. We'll leave tomorrow. Oh, John! Oh, we're, we're going to 
have another storm. Yes, it certainly has come up quickly. Uh, Sunset, there wasn't a sign of a storm. Uh, it's, it's as if Stormhouse knows we're leaving and wants to live up to its reputation on our last night. Well, darling, I think I'll go to bed and dream about leaving here tomorrow. Coming? No, I'll finish my pipe and tell Andrew our parents. All right, darling. I'll bring my diary up to date while I wait. Don't be long now. What is it, Andrew? Land sakes, Mr. John. A real granddaddy of a lightning bolt hit the cliff just now, right beside the burying ground. It opened up a big crack of the earth, running right across her grave. Her grave? Was that? I could look right down and see the top of the coffin. Oh, well, you can fix it in the morning. We're going to be leaving, Andrew, but we'll settle the details tomorrow. Better turn in now. I'll do the same. All right, Mr. John. Sure is a humdinger of a storm. And tomorrow we leave here forever. I do so hope it's going to make a difference. John has seemed so depressed lately. I wonder if it's my fault. If he regrets marrying me. No, I won't think that. Not even this storm can I can frighten me now. I know John loves me and... Who turned out the light? Who came in then? John, is that you? John, where are you? Don't tease me like this. You're frightening me. John! Ah! And now to continue the story, as it is written in the sealed book. After the great storm had opened up Lizette's grave so that her coffin was plainly visible, Nora had a midnight visitor. There was a scream and a body crumpled to the floor. The next morning, the sheriff came to talk to John. That's all of it, Sheriff. That's all I know. Nora screamed... When I got to her, she was lying there on the floor. Dead. (laughs) Murdered. Hmm. But the weapon, Mr. Lester. We know it was that antique ivory paper knife of yours, because the point broke off in the wound. But where is it? I don't know. I tell you, I didn't see it. I see. Well, I think you better come with me for the time being, Mr. Lester. Here's a prisoner, Doctor. You can see him for 15 minutes. Oh, Howard, thank heaven you've come. John, John, how are you? Oh, how am I? I don't know. I don't care. How did they caught Nora's murder? They still think you did it. I... I gather that they did. And the ivory knife hasn't been found. Nowhere. And we've searched every inch. John, think. I know when you found Nora, you were shocked and dazed. But the knife, surely you saw it. Surely you drew it from the wound, put it down somewhere. You must have. I've tried to think hard. I'm sure I'm right. There was no knife. Only Nora. Crumpled beside her writing desk. The blood staining her nightdress. The wind screaming outside as if in triumph. I understand. I know you didn't murder Nora. I don't know how we're going to convince the world. Is it... as bad as that? As bad as that. If only the knife had been found, it could have been suicide then. But the knife is gone. And you testify that Andrew is innocent. So as there wasn't any other living soul but yourself in the house that night. I see... Well, I've told them all I can. I don't know how the knife could have disappeared. There's nothing more I can do. Even though they hang me. And hang John Lester they did. 
after a due and lawful trial. For in the jury's eyes, the fact of the missing ivory knife that had killed Nora Lester was damning evidence. After the execution, John's old friend, Dr. Warren, conveyed the body homeward to Stormhouse, where he and faithful old John buried it in the tiny burying ground. Andrew dug the grave close between the graves of Nora and Lizette. So close, in fact, that while digging, his pick struck a coffin. <coughs> Doctor, look! The corner of a coffin. Lizette's coffin, it must be. Yes. That night the lightning struck the cliff. Must have moved her coffin round somehow. I remember the grave looked a little queer next morning when I fixed things up. I guess we'll have to dig it up so we can put it back in its proper place. Yeah, guess we better, Doctor. Well, won't take long. <laughs> Yeah, Doctor. Guess that does it all right. Good. Now we'll just slide the coffin back into its place. You've made plenty of room. <sighs> Doctor Warren. What is it, Andrew? The lid of this coffin's been tampered with. Tampered with? But that's yeah. impossible. Come take a look, Doctor. You'll see I'm right. I guess I'd better. Stand aside, Andrew. Yes. <clears throat> now, just what do you mean? Look, look, Doctor. All along both sides and this end... The screws... They're all loose. Yes. They've been pulled out of the wood when someone lifted the lid. This coffin's been forced open. That's right, Doctor. Only, look, how was it forced open? There's no tool marks on the wood. No tool marks. Then whoever did this just didn't leave any. Andrew, we've got to look inside and see why Lizette's coffin was molested. Uh, maybe we'd better leave it just as it is, Doctor. We can't do that. Here, put your pick under the edge and the lid. Uh, that's it. Now lift. Well, if you say so. Easy does it. There. It's loose. Now we'll see what... <gasps> I told you. I told you we shouldn't open it. A bloody knife. The ivory knife that killed Nora. Here in Lizette's coffin. They hung Mr. John because they couldn't find the knife. And it's been here all along, held tight in Lizette's hand. So it was beautiful Lizette who killed Nora. Lizette, whose jealousy was so great that it reached back from behind the veil of death. And it was Lizette who took the knife of murder back into her grave with her, so that John, too, would suffer her vengeance. Or was it? Was there some other answer? You must decide that for yourself, for the sealed book does not say. You have heard the story in all its strangeness, just as it is written here. And now, keeper of the book, before you close the great book, show us the tale we tell next time. This one? Ah, yes. Why, this is amazing. It's a tale of a man who killed, a corpse that laughed, and a murder victim who died twice. A tale called The Accusing Corpse. Be sure to be with us again next time when the sound of the great gong heralds another strange and exciting tale from The Sealed Book. The Sealed Book, written by Bob Arthur and David Cogan, is produced and directed by Jock McGregor.